All right, so I had some requests to talk about easy breeding methods. So these are going to be your most basic breeding methods. And I get, I get a little into a little uh, more complex stuff, which I've kind of already covered in expansion model beekeeping. So I'm, I mean, unless you really want me to go over the same stuff again, we'll just kind of breeze over that a little bit. So uh, again, ask questions all you want. Tell me what you want to hear. Yes. Oh, the recorder. Don't forget the recorder. Thank you. I think it goes on. Line in. There we go. On. It says hi. All right, we're on. Here we go. Good. This, this recorder is the backup in case the camera doesn't work or doesn't sound good so that, so that we have backup audio for the podcast and also for uh, YouTube. So I want everybody to have this afterwards in case you have any more questions. You thought you heard me say something, you can go back and check. Or uh, you forgot what I said about something, you know, you have your own questions or recorded in case you forgot when you asked. So you can go back and check this out. All of my information is free to access. So if you have any one of my videos, I've got 30 some videos on YouTube now. I'm starting to do a lot more how-to videos. Uh, all of my podcasts are available free to access online. I've got 44 episodes so far. Um, I want everything, you know, I'm, I've, I've, I've made myself an educator. I want everything to be available to all of you so that you have what you need to do what you want. And if you want to throw me a few bucks, that'd be nice too. <laughs> All right, we've talked a little bit about this, but let's just go over it again, because this is pretty important. Um, it's really important to raise your own bees, because again, if you buy bees from somewhere else, you're getting bees that you don't know what they're gonna be like. Um, if you have a trusted source that has worked well for you in the past, then, then that's, a safe thing to, that's a safe thing to get. But the bigger, uh, the bigger the companies get, especially down south, their focus is gonna be production, and um, not pest resistance, right? They're gonna produce the maximum number of queens possible uh, for the least cost, and they're not gonna care a whole lot about the details. So you may be able to buy a queen for 20 or $30 from Texas or Alabama or somewhere, uh, but that queen is gonna have virtually no wintering ability compared to the winter that you'll have here and some of you are here from further north and your winters are even more harsh, so that's important. Cost, again, I'm, I'm gonna hound the thing about paying for bees. When you're paying for bees, you have an investment in them. You, you wanna protect them and save them and help them, and that's good, but for the purposes of treatment-free beekeeping and producing bees that survive on their own long-term by themselves, that's not gonna be profitable for you. The learning experience for me is, is, for a lot of my beekeeping experience has been the driver of what I'm doing. Every year I, I make a list of things that I want to do. So, you know, when I first started it was installing packages and feeding and just building hives and building frames. Nowadays it's doing more complex things like uh, building new styles of hives that I can try out and then I can recommend new styles of hives to other people. Um, a few years ago it was grafting and, and coming up with these methods of um, expansion, the most efficient means possible. So for you, um, they teach us in engineering school that we should never stop learning. We should always be in a continual state of um, expanding our minds, of learning new things, and of refreshing the things that we already, always, already know because sometimes it can get pushed to the back and we forget we forget details, right? So it's good to, to go back and read books sometimes, read um, instruction manuals, you know. For entertainment purposes, it's always fun to go back and watch movies that you've liked before. The same thing goes with beekeeping. When you go back um, and watch your favorite movie over again, you, re you see new things that you didn't notice before. And the same thing when you go back and, and learn new things with beekeeping. You'll go back and learn um, something that somebody said that it, or something's written on the page and you've just you you read it and it didn't click 
you go back and read it again and it clicks. And so you, you need to be in a state of continual learning. You can focus on traits uh, as you as you get further on in your beekeeping experience, you can, you can decide not to put up with hives that don't cut the mustard anymore, and you can do something about it, right? You're not just protecting your, your, your hive, you're, you're actually molding the future as far as uh, the way your bees act and the type of behaviors they're in. Um, you know, I, like I said before, I don't like mean bees. So I don't have to put up with them anymore because now I know how to replace them and requeen, and that's, that's something you can learn. High quality queens, we talked about that. Um, fun is always important. If you're not enjoying this, like maybe find a different hobby. I'm not telling you if you don't do this, this my way, then don't do it. I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is, as with anything, if you don't enjoy it, you know, don't stick with it. Don't be tied to it. Um, my my sign out line on my podcast every episode is have fun keeping bees because if you're not having fun you probably shouldn't be doing it and um, you know that goes with with your hobbies your job uh, anything you do you should enjoy it or at least feel that it's profitable and useful um, some of the most some of the most fulfilled people are people that have absolutely terrible horrific jobs but they're doing it for a reason they're doing it doing it because they feel like it's helping people and that makes it worth it and if you want you can maybe make a little money which is which can be fun itself even if you're not doing something specifically for profit making a little money off you know to make a little bit of money to pay for new equipment or for other hobbies, it's, it adds to the fun of the prospect. Uh, talked about swarms already. Some of, these, some of these aspects of these talks are gonna be a little bit overlap. Like I said, I've never done all of them in a row before, so um, we've already, we just talked about swarms, so unless you, there's something else you wanna talk about that. What was, oh, moving swarms, that's right. We didn't talk about what you should do after you catch them. So just to go back to that point, um, a lot of times you'll have traps that'll catch a swarm and they'll, they'll go in there, but then for some reason they leave. And that's okay. Um, a lot of times those swarms that aren't ready to settle down aren't the best quality swarms. Jason tells me that a lot of those that he has um, gone and, and um, caught, if they've, you know, they left the hive and go land somewhere and he goes and catches them, a lot of them don't survive the winter. So even if you don't catch a swarm, if a swarm goes in your box and they don't stay there, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Maybe they weren't in the best case. Maybe they don't have a queen. Maybe something's wrong and so they, they can't settle down. And then so once you do get a hive, a colony move into your hive, go ahead and a lot of times they'll be at one of your friend's house or something, um, cultivate, cultivate relationships where you're getting, uh, where you have people whose home, ho you know, whose yards or whatever you can use to catch swarms in if they're not beekeepers. You can sell that as a way, if they want to help the bees, a way they can do that without having to be a beekeeper. And so that's good for everybody. So a lot of, a lot of really good swarm trap hosts will call you or send pictures, text you pictures and things when, when, the, when the hive lands. So what you wanna do is give the hive a good week or two to settle in and start laying brood. If you've got that nice comb in the middle as your bait, the queen's gonna start laying in there and once the bees are settled down and start brooding, they're not gonna to wanna to leave as easily. If you catch a swarm in a box and you move the box the next day, they might decide that they don't like all this movement going on and they'll leave. So that's an important thing. Was there anything else? Okay, great. Again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to interrupt me. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'll get you next. Um, what if weather interferes with uh, your the plans to remove a swarm or move it, move it? Leaving it there can... Yeah, it shouldn't be a problem to leave them there for a few days, a few days extra. Just wait out the weather, whatever's going on. Um, 
depends on whether it's in a trap or just hanging from a branch. Yes, if it's hanging from a branch and you're retrieving the swarm that way, you, you want to get it pretty soon because it's planning on leaving eventually anyway, so you might as well get it now. Yes, oh, you first. Yeah, uh, okay, you have a swarm in your trap, and you say, okay, let him settle down. I understand about that for a week or so, and then what do you do then? Right. So what you're going to do is uh, you're going to lock them in the box. You can do that. If you've got one of the disc entrances, you can just switch it around so it's covering. Um, you, uh, probably one of the easier ways to do it is get an old piece of window screen and cut it up into strips. And then you can staple that over any holes just as long as, long as they have enough so they can breathe. And you're going to want to um, move them in the evening not too not too late in the evening because you'll be disturbing people but when most of the bees have gotten into the hive and if they're bearding on the hive you can spritz them with water a little bit and that will make them think that it's raining or we assume it makes them think that it's raining and they will they'll tend to go into the hive because uh, a lot of warm humid nights bees will beard outside the hive and they're just hanging there to allow space in the hive for air to circulate yeah, so if you, if you give them a little bit of water spritz, they'll, they'll cool off and they'll kind of go back in. So you can catch most of them. And you don't have to catch all of them. You know, you just want the bulk of them. So uh, you take all the frames out and then reinstall them? Um, it depends on how you do it. If you're putting a hive, if you're putting a pre-made hive as a swarm trap, then you can just go set it in your new location where you want it. Yes. And stack boxes on it and you're good to go. Uh, let's say I have an old one, you know, an old used one as a trap. So if I had a box that was just a trap and I wasn't planning on using it as part of a hive later, then what I would do is I would take that box and set it in the new location, open it back up so they can, they can go out, give it a few days again to get acclimated to the area, and then later on I would just come and, and move that put a new box and bottom board in place, move all the frames over, and because they're now situated to that area, they'll come all back to that box. And they won't be, and then you can just take the rest of the stuff wherever. Thanks. No problem. Yeah, my question is sort of along that line, but on those swirl traps, you've got different sizes. You had talked about how you would make them up to medium and swirl. Mm -hmm. Are you sticking with, you also said you were trying to stick with medium frames. Are you putting just medium frames in some of those big deeps? And then, is it, I mean, if you've got a lot of empty space, the bees will draw that out and fill it up with cross them. So are you moving them before that happens? I, excuse me, I put the correct size frame in the box. I am in the process of switching over to medium frames, but I still have a lot of deep boxes until those all get used to the point where they don't work anymore. Um, and plus, a lot of people want to buy deep nukes, so it's probably going to behoove me to, to, to still have a few hives around that, that I used to make deep nukes out of. So I probably won't ever get totally away from it, but for, for bulk of everything, I want to switch to mediums because they're significantly lighter. But you could, you could put medium frames in a deep box, or you could put deep frames in a double medium box. And um, they're gonna they're gonna build from the top, so depending on how long you they've been in there before you get to them, you probably have a pretty good chance of uh, not having any burr cone. And like I told you, with the way Jason does his traps, um, the, he has he only puts eight frames in a ten frame trap, so there's still some extra space in there too. And he says he rarely has problems with them building out to that far before he rehives them. Yeah. If you do have a box trap and you catch it on your problem, but it's not in your aviary, is there a distance that you can or can't move it? Yes. Uh, you, the typical recommendation is two feet or two miles. You've probably heard that. Um, but if you need to move them, say, 100 yards or so, you can do that. And the, the best way to get them to reorient themselves to that new location is to lock them in or kind of 
hedge them in by, by putting grass in the entrance or some, some way shaking up the system, block the entrance with some grass so it takes some time for them to work it out. Um, and you'll still, even then, you'll still get a few bees that go back to the old location, but over time, unless there's several hundred, most of them should wander away and eventually find another hive to go into. Anybody else? Alrighty. Alright, so the basic way that we're going to split hives is what we call the walk away split. And the reason why it's called this is because you just make two hives and then walk off. Um, the easiest, you don't have to, you don't have to find the queen, right? So if you, if you have trouble finding a queen, a lot of people aren't well practiced as that, at that, you don't have to. Just make sure that both hives have some open brood or eggs, you know, then a young enough brood so that they can make a new queen. And whichever one doesn't have a queen will make a new queen. And you can do this with um, Langstroth hives or any hive with movable frames, right? If you have top bar hives or Layens hives or Warre hives, which are semi-movable, you can split. If you have uh, small boxes, like uh, either a Layens hive, smaller style Layens hives, or no, Warre hives, or like eight frame mediums where you're pretty certain that the brood nest is split up between multiple boxes and you have a pretty reasonable chance that there'll be eggs in both boxes then you can do like michael bush does and just take a, a stack of say six boxes or whatever it is and just divide it into you know do one or the other until you have two stacks of three and you'll have a pretty good chance of making sure that both boxes will have eggs and whichever one doesn't have the queen will make a new queen there are some things that you can manipulate to to even things out because if you were to take one hive and make it into two right next to each other okay you're going to have most of the field bees when they come back and they have two hives to choose from where they had one before they will find the one that has the queen in it right so most of your bees are going to end up in the hive let's just say the left one has the hive with the bees in it so what you can do is you can then, a week or so later, you can switch them back again. And now the, hive, the bees that were coming back to this hive are now coming back to the other hive. And you can even it out that way until the new hive gets a new queen. The downside with that is if you don't watch your timing and you switch the hives while the, the virgin queen is out mating, she's going to come back to the wrong hive and she'll probably displace the original queen and then you'll have another hive that's queenless. So that's an important thing to think about. Uh, like with moving a hive, you can also take the new hive split and put it a couple miles away so that whatever bees are in it will be there instead of here. The problem with that is if you're splitting during the day, which you probably should because bees don't like it when you mess with them at night, you're going to lose most of your field bees. They're going to be out flying and they'll come back to the old hive location. Um, what I like to do when I, when I did this um, is I would find the queen if you're, if you're adept at finding the queen. I spent a lot of time searching for queens so I got a lot better at it. And really it's just about practice. You know, it's, it's like with anything else. You're looking for something, you're learning, you're, you're programming your brain to recognize a certain pattern, okay? We humans are really good at recognizing faces. We're programmed from birth to recognize faces. You're looking for a certain pattern that visually you think is a queen bee, but really you're looking for a pattern so that you're scanning across a frame and spotting something that then once you take a second look at it, your brain says, that's a queen bee. That takes skill and it takes practice. It's a skill that you can learn. You may be better at, at it than other people, you may be worse, but it's like anything, um, we all can get better with practice from wherever we are. What other things can we do? There's also, you can, if you stack, if you start with a stack hive, if you have an upper entrance, you'll have bees coming from both upper and, and lower. And so when you then split it, 
then you still have field force coming into each hive. So if you have uh, the foresight to set up a hive with an upper entrance with, with two sets of bees coming into two entrances, and then you then divide the hive, you'll have those bees will still continue to go into those two sets of entrances. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. Um, and there, are, I'm not saying this is the total list. This is just some things that I, that I've done and that I've thought of. And if you have any, if you have anything else that works, then by all means do that. Yeah. One slight modification is the hive that doesn't have the queen in it is going to generate some cells, queen cells. Right. And if you've got queen cells on more than one frame, then take the extra frames out and put them in a nuke. And so you. Right. Uh, you'll generate more than one new queen. Yeah, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Okay. Yeah. The one downside with the basic method, the walkaway split method, is that it's a bit wasteful. All right, you're taking half of a hive and using it to create these queens, and they're going to create 10, maybe 20, probably not 20, but at least 10 new queens. And whichever one hatches out first is going to be the one that kills all the rest and becomes the new queen. So that's a bit wasteful. We've, we've, we've invested this major chunk of bees and hive into making this queen, and we've, we've wasted a number of our, you know, maybe 90% of the queens, 90% of the queens that we've made are lost. So this, what you can see here, I made, this one year I made, I forget how many, but it was, a whole bunch, probably 10 or more walkaway splits. And I made them all at the same time so that when the queens were mated and started, at about the time that I knew they were mating or knew they were hatching, I went and looked around in front of the hive and I found these queens that were discarded. Because normally when the, the bees haul out a dead bee, they'll fly off with it, but with a queen, and drones, they can't fly off with it because it's too heavy, and so they ended up right at the, the front of the hive. So that's how I found these queens. I was kind of bummed because I really like the dark queens, and I lost that one. So there are some other methods that we use so we can be a little more efficient. Um, a lot of them are just from favorable circumstances, like this one. Uh, if you discover a hive that's in the process of superseding, this can happen later in the year. This is probably not going to happen in the spring when you have your main flows and stuff. So if you find a hive that's in the process of superseding, supersedure, for those of you that don't know, is when uh, a hive naturally replaces their queen. And this happens probably more regularly than you realize. Um, in Arkansas, my queens were often superseded after one or two years, just as a normal practice. They just did it every year. And having bees that are well adapted to replacing their queens naturally and being successful at doing that is a positive trait. Okay, if you have bees that, that go queenless every time one of their queens fail, then they're kind of naturally select themselves out of the population. But if the queen fails and they're able to make a new queen, and they're good at it, that's good. That's good for our bees. So if you catch one of these, you can, you can cut the queen cells out. Or if they're on multiple frames, you can do that as well. And you can put multiple frames and create multiple splits out of the same hive. And that's more efficient with our queens. Even if you have several cells on one frame, you're getting more than one queen out of the whole system. So it's more efficient. But it, like, it might be the wrong time of the year if, if a supersedure happens later in the year and you make splits, you're going to have trouble getting them built up for winter. So that's something to be aware of. This one's more fun. This is with uh, watching for swarm cells. We talked about this one earlier. Um, basically, swarm, swarming season is going to be coming up soon. So you have the opportunity to, when you're inspecting your hives, find a, a hive that's in, in swarming mode, and so you can split that out into many different nukes. Yeah? The idea that swarm, uh, swarm cells produce swarming queens, is that, is that really true? I'm pretty skeptical because the only ones I've seen were really good queens that can't swarm cells. <laughs> 
Yeah, the question is um, basically asking about bees that swarm, are they going to swarm more often in the future, right? Or if you raise queens from swarm cells. Yeah. Yeah, I don't really buy that myself. I think the, the swarming, first of all, swarms are good. Swarms are for the bees. They may not be for us, but swarms are necessary for the bees to reproduce. And so we want at least a minimum level of swarming. If a hive never swarms, then they're not reproducing, right? Unless we're splitting them, which is a different situation. Um, but also a, I tend to chalk up most swarming to um, management errors. I think with, with what I've done, um, I, this is something that people argue with me about a bit. I leave my, when I, when I harvest my honey, I put the boxes back on the hives and let the bees watch the comb throughout the fall. So I don't have to worry about wax moths generally. I have found that when the bees come through winter with a big stack of boxes, this is my theory, hypothesis. Um, at the end of winter, the bees take stock of the size of the hive and they decide whether or not they're going to swarm that year. And so if they have a big empty hive, they think, well, we're probably not going to be able to fill this up this year, so we won't swarm this year. We'll fill it up and then next year it'll be full and it'll be mostly full and then we'll swarm because the hive is full. But the way that beekeepers are taught to keep their hives and they take the supers off the hive and store them somewhere else. And so the hive isn't very big. And so at the end of winter, when the bees take stock of what's going on, they see this small hive and they think, oh, we can fill this up and we can swarm this year, no problem. A couple months later, the beekeeper comes on and puts supers on the hive to, as the bees have built up now. And they think, oh, the bees have built up. I put supers on the hive, they'll fill them up with honey and I'll be good. And then a week later, the hive swarms. And they wonder why. Oh, I put supers on it, but they swarmed. Well, it's my theory that the bees decided to swarm a long time ago, and anything that you've done recently doesn't really bear on the situation. That's my theory. I could be wrong. But I have pretty low swarming rates, and I think it's because of how big I keep my hives. This year, this last winter, I, uh, my over, I overwintered hives much smaller, so I would, if my theory is correct, I would expect to have a higher swarming rate this year. Um, yeah. You're using the actual swarm cells, not a super cell on this. Now, whenever you, after you split them, swarm cells and some brood and some, some you know, food and whatnot, and you made your splits, do you have trouble with that new split trying to swarm once that queen hatches? Not out? usually. Not usually with our bees here. Um, European, I mean, European now bees, the, the black bees and things, they tend to have more secondary swarms. We have our primes, our, our normal, here the climate seems to support one big prime swarm, and then occasionally you'll see secondary swarms with the new queens that hatch out. But if there aren't multiple queens in the hive, then swarming would be a death sentence because the original hive will die out and so they the, the only time there's usually going to be multiple swarms afterwards after swarms is when there are multiple queens in the same box and they would they would generally want to be really big before they did something like that so that a, a secondary swarm would be big enough to be able to survive the other reason i asked is our beekeeping group down where i came from he said when you see that swarm cell we're going to they're going to swarm no matter what you do that's what they taught, they taught us, that's why I was... Yeah. Them. And the original queen will. She'll, she'll try, unless you split the hive up to, to the point where the conditions are such that they don't want to swarm anymore. That's why with, with this, we're taking that one hive and we're making eight out of it. And none of them will be strong enough to, be, to want to swarm after that. Yeah. When you started talking about this, said that you left your, you put your boxes back on in the fall after the harvest. <coughs> and then you said, you start talking about leaving them on all the winter, so which is it? 
It's both. I yeah, when I when I'm done harvesting in the summer or fall, whenever I do it, I put them back on immediately as soon as they're cleaned out, and just leave them on for the rest of the year. So you're not concerned about them having a hard time keeping warm. I haven't had that problem. I've heard of that, and it may be a difference in climate. It may not be a viable option for everybody. All beekeeping is local, but that's my experience. You put them over an inner cover or empty boxes? No, nope, just just straight on top. Yeah. Um, I think I missed something important. What does a swarm cell look like? In the, in, it's in the hive, right? You're not talking about the big fall outside. Right. Inside. What's a swarm cell look like? Um, a swarm cell is going to look, it's going to have a surface almost like a peanut, kind of a ribbed surface, and it's going to be made of wax, and it's going to be toward, generally toward the bottom of the, the comb. So you'll see them hanging off bottom parts of, uh, if there's a gap in the comb between the comb and the frame, they'll be hanging there. Sometimes they'll be hanging between the frames. Supersedure cells are going to look similar, but a supersedure cell is not purpose-built for a queen. What they do is they find a queen uh, or find a, the right aged larva in the cell and they're going to chew out part of the cell. And they're going to fill it with royal jelly and then build a new queen cell around it. So supersedure cells will be in the center, more toward the center of the brood area where swarm cells will be out to the edge. Yeah. Sort of, but it'll be made out of wax. I'm sorry I don't have a picture. I need to make a note that I get swarm cell picture. <laughs> we can, yeah, we can look up one on the internet and, and show you what that looks like. Anybody else? Yeah. So if I, have, if I don't have any of those cells and my friend has those, Yes. Yes. You can, if you want to take a swarm cell from somewhere, you can cut it out with a thin, a thin knife. You know, just kind of saw it out. Give it a, a good berth around it. You want to. You don't want to disturb the cell itself. Um, and you can take that and put it, you can kind of stick it into one frame and make a whole new hive with it with brood from another hive, brood and bees from a totally different hive. So if your friend has a swarm cell, uh, you can get that swarm cell and start a new hive with frames from your own bees. And you just kind of stick that to a frame and then stick another frame and don't squish it, but you know, put them together so you hold it in there. And then that cell will hatch out and be a new queen. That, yep. But that, that'll be a, a, um, a small hive, right? Will, it, will that be enough to make it through the winter? If, you, if they have time to build up. Uh, usually if something like that happens during swarm season, which will be coming up probably in a few weeks here, that'll be time for that hive to build up. You may have to help them out, maybe feed them or something to help them out. But that depends on your conditions. Like I said, in Arkansas, I could raise nukes up from from two frames from a brood of frame a brood and a frame of honey, and I could raise that up into a ten frame hive before the end of the year without feeding. That's not the case everywhere, because that is kind of, I mean, that's more than just a swarm. That's that's starting with the bare minimum, so they may need help. So if it's really not big enough. By the end of the fall. If it doesn't, if it's not big enough by the end of the fall, then you can combine it with another hive, or you might try overwintering it as a nucleus hive, but that'll need feed also. That's a, that's another topic that we could talk about sometime. Is I've never myself overwintered nucleus hives, but it is common in certain areas as a matter of practice because you don't have time enough in one growing season to grow a hive from a split all the way into a full-size hive. So they'll overwinter nukes 
And then so the next year they can grow them from a nuke up to a full size hive. Yeah, a lot of times they put the nukes right next to you. Yes. Yes. Um, that's most of the people that I've heard that do that are in uh, the far northeast, Vermont and Maine, up in that area. And they'll do uh, deep boxes with four frame nukes with two feeders in the middle. And so each side will have access to one feeder and they'll overwinter them that way. And then they, sometimes they can double them up so you have uh, a 10 frame nuke that's five over five. That's another way to do it. Yeah. If you combine two weak hives, how do you decide which queen you want to shoot? Um, well, preferably you wouldn't combine two weak hives. You would combine a weak hive with a stronger hive, so you know which one to do to keep. Um, if you, if the weaker hive were just young, so it hadn't had a chance to build up yet. Yeah, whichever if you one. Don't do that. That's not going to work uh, because if you put two queen right hives together, they will duke it out and they will destroy the whole program. So um, the best way that I find to combine hives, especially if you're doing like two five frame nukes into a 10 frame box, uh, what you'll do is choose a box that's foreign to both of them because bees can tell immediately uh, when they're in the, if you take a frame out of one hive and put it in another hive or in an empty box, you'll, if you pay attention, you can listen, you can hear their, the way they're buzzing will change. They will know within seconds that they're not in their hive anymore and their whole attitude will change. So if you combine, uh, first you want to find the queen and get rid of her and then combine those two hives into a third box. Or if you're combining, say, two 10 frame hives, you would combine them into two new boxes, two fresh boxes, so that they would know immediately that they're not in their, in their hive, and so that kind of throws off their defense mechanism so they, they don't fight after that. Another common method is newspaper. You take uh, a couple of sheets of newspaper and put them between two boxes, and uh, either put a slit in it or uh, poke a hole or whatever, but not too much, and so it, it takes time for them to chew out the newspaper and get used to each other. That's true. It depends on depends on how you do it. You want to make sure you have enough circulation. We've had we've done that and it's worked well. Yeah. Hive, squish that queen and combine it with a stronger hive and use the newspaper. Yeah. They chew through and have done great. Yeah. And the as far as the ventilation, usually when you're taking a hive hives apart and putting them in different places, um, the the propolis that has been on both hives won't match up or the hives will be slightly crooked and there will be cracks. So there's rarely in a in a fresh stack like that, there's rarely a time when there's not a crack where they can breathe in. They'll, and, but they'll, they'll fix it up within a few days and there won't be cracks anymore. So, uh, this was earlier today, you were talking about, you had like, you were talking about creating a new, basically, by if you had like five strong hives, you can just take one frame from each one and put them together. Um, I may have heard it wrong, but where would you, be throwing a bunch of nurse bees together from five different hives and have the same problem, or would you try to just use five frames but only get the nurses from one? No, you can take, you can leave the bees on all of them, and when you're putting them in that new box, their defensive mechanism will be totally disarmed. Firstly, because they're they're nurse bees, and nurse bees don't mind; they they don't really care if they're if they're moved around. Um, the forager bees are the ones that are really get angry if they get mixed together. Does that answer your question? Yeah. All right. Anybody else? All right. Moving on here. Have I got all these points? Sure have. All right. This one is kind of similar to the previous two, but if you want to, again, make more more hives out of one and so what you're going to do is you're just going to take the queen if you can find the queen you need to be able to find the queen with this one take the queen with a frame or two of brood and put her in a nuke by herself 
the remaining hive is going to make new queens. And when those new queens are ready, or right before they're ready, you're gonna split that out again into a bunch of new hives. During that time though, one of the cool things that'll happen is because the worker bees don't have a bunch of new brood to feed, they're gonna gather more honey. So you can sometimes pull a good crop of honey off of a queenless hive this way. When, and the same thing goes for when you're splitting for the walkaway split. The, the split, if, if the split that doesn't have the queen is the one at the home base, and they're not feeding a bunch of new brood, those bees are gonna gather a bunch of honey and you can get a, you can get a bumper, hop, bumper crop off of that hive sometimes. So when, we're, when the queen cells are ready, we're just gonna go start a whole bunch of nukes and in this way, this is a little messier because um, queenless hives are not very stable all the time, um, especially if you dump a whole bunch of bees together. If you're trying purposefully to make a strong queenless hive, sometimes they'll swarm or the bees will go to another hive or something. Queenless hives are a bit cagey. So that's why I use queen right cell building. Now the way it's typically done in commercial situations, which you can do it this way if you want, but um, the, what they'll do is they will do grafting and, and do it into a purposeful built queenless hive with tons and tons of young nurse bees. And so that they will, at that point, they will pretty much start every queen cell that you give them. But they won't end up finishing all the queen cells that you give them. So what they do is they then split off some of those queen cells into multiple queen right finisher hives to finish those hive, those cells off. That's not something that I really recommend for the hobbyist, but if you wanna, if you wanna try out the commercial way, you can do that, to learn some new things. Some drone stuff. As I said before, a lot of people think that drones are lazy because we see the fact that they don't feed themselves, they don't gather nectar or pollen, their job is to fly out and uh, mate with a queen. But they work really hard at that, so we don't, we don't need to say that they're lazy. And they're not really lazy because they also, when you see them in the hive, you'll also often find them above the brood nest. And the theory is that they're actually helping to keep heat in the brood nest by, by them being there. So they're helping to heat the hive. Um, one of the concerns that a lot of people have when talking about developing treatment-free bees is that you won't be able to control breeding in your area. And that's true. However, I don't think you need to. Um, and the reason why I don't think that's true, don't think you need to, is that we've had about 25 years of artificial breeding and artificial breeding has not produced treatment-free bees. They've produced bees that have a certain trait locked in that you can buy, but even those bees are still recommended to be treated. However, treatment-free beekeepers have been doing this for nearly, some people claim that they have kept bees continuously since before Varroa showed up. Um, I know Dee Lesby down in Arizona, she kept bees continuously after Varroa showed up, but before her bees became Africanized. So she had that also. Um, so the idea that you have to control your drone population, I don't think that's necessarily true. And th there's another reason for that is I don't think there's, one of the things that always bugged me is the show, The Magic School Bus, because they're teaching kids science, but they're calling it magic. There is no magic fix. There's no magic set of genetics. There's no magic thing we call treatment-free bees. They are, there's just a mixture of traits that have been concentrated over time because they best allow the bees to survive in their environment. And it's not one trait. In fact, it's not probably even five traits. It's probably a dozen or more traits. And they're just needed in the right combinations. 
And they don't even have to all be the same bees. The queen doesn't carry all the genetics. She's carrying genetics from 10 or more drones. So you only need even a certain portion of those drones to carry the genetics necessary so that a certain number of the bees have what's needed to survive treatment free. You just need a certain amount and by you being in the area and working with your own bees treatment free and catching feral bees you can oftentimes, mo nearly all the time as far as I know, collect what you need to get your bees to survive largely treatment free. Largely survive treatment free. Right? Just, just reasonable loss rates. There's some, been some interesting genetic studies that show that feral bees uh, affect the kept bee population, but the kept bee population doesn't really get into the feral population. Because the feral population is treatment free, they're more efficient, they're not being helped. Maybe their drones fly faster, maybe their queens fly faster, but they seem to maintain this, this viable population and they will affect commercial and treated bees, but it doesn't so much go the other way. Our, our kept bees and treated bees can't really compete very well with the feral population. So that's an important thing to remember. And uh, you can also uh, promote drones in your own hives by making drone hives, and you can do that using foundationless frames. Um, a lot, one of the complaints people get when they first start foundationless is they'll put a frame of an empty frame in a hive and the bees will fill it full of, found, fill it full of drones because if they've had foundation they've been kept from building as much drone as they want. But you can then use those drones to affect the genetics in your area if you have solid treatment free bees. And then we talked about my method earlier so we don't need to go over that again. <coughs> All right, do you have any more questions? I haven't used the, the green plastic drone frames. I do have some, um, somebody gave me some frames that had like one strip of drone across the top and then regular foundation on the bottom. And I just, I, I, uh, I took the strips of drone on the top and I put several of them together to make solid drone frames, but I've never used the green ones. I saw them, I was at the Man Lake store in Woodland, California a couple of days ago and I saw them there. I thought about buying them, but I figured it's just so much easier to, to take an empty frame and put it in a hive and they'll draw a drone out for me, so I don't need them. Yeah. When people talk about colony losses, a lot of times they focus on varroa and about starvation. How about small hive beetles? Do you find that they're in any way uh, enough of a threat that they need to be not necessarily treated for, but collected, removed from the hive? Where, where I live, there's a lot of humidity, the ground is moist, and I get lots of small hive beetles in my, in my colonies. I personally haven't had a huge problem with small hive beetles. Um, where I was in Arkansas, it's humid, but the, the soil is very clay-like and not a lot of sand. So they didn't do really well. I did, I did get beetles in my hives. I regularly saw beetles in my hives up to, I think one dead out, I found like two or three dozen beetles. But what I didn't have was larva. So, and the larva are the ones that do the destruction, you know, of course. So the adult beetles running around in the hive are not being destructive? No, they're not. They might be eating honey and pollen here or there, but they're not causing major damage like the larvae do. So the question has been, can the bees develop traits to resist the larvae of the hive beetles and deal with that? Uh, I believe there are bees that do that, along with uh, similar traits that help with um, hygienic behavior and stuff. Or, I've also, I forget who I was talking to, was talking about how bees will sometimes use propolis to corral the adult beetles and keep them from getting in anywhere. So, there are, yes, that treatment-free bees can, can, can be developed to deal with that problem. I thought the, I thought the larva was in the ground and the beetles 
crawled up into the hives after they hatched from the ground. I didn't realize there was larva in the hives. Yeah, the, the, unless I'm misunderstanding, the, the beetles lay eggs in the hive and the larva slime up the hive and burrow through it. And then once they've gained all the food they want, they go down and pupate in the ground. Is that right? Am I got that right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. Just want to be sure. I don't want to say something stupid. Yeah. Um, do I consider oil-filled beetle traps a treatment? For myself, I probably would, but if you're, I don't want to be unyielding for, especially for new beekeepers who are trying to make their place and get things going. Um, if you need beetle traps to get your hives to survive when you're first starting, then by all means use them. They're cheap, they're easy, they don't affect the chemistry of the hive. Um, but if you get a couple years in and you, you can't keep your hives alive without beetle traps, which I've never heard of that actually happen, happening. I, I think people eventually, once the bees, because the beetle trap doesn't completely eliminate the problem of beetles, it just reduces it a little bit. So if you need to get those, if you need those to get going, then by all means use them.